Okay, the format is as follows. Uh, Anthony and I will each say uh, a few words, pose a few questions to start the, um, the discussion going. And after that, we'll open it up to questions, but we are not answering the questions. The questions will be answered by the panelists, and uh, don't go away. <laughs> so after we, we are done, uh, we'll start right away. Okay, um, so what we thought we'd do is I would say, uh, I would raise some questions for the economists, and Jess would raise some questions for the philosophers, since um, that will um, enforce interdisciplinarity. Um, so, um, the only thing I really knew about the economics of uh, migration before today was something uh, that uh, Paul Volcker told me. Uh, I asked him once after hearing him talk about the, um, the wonders of free movement of capital, uh, whether those wonders wouldn't apply just as well to the free movement of labor, those arguments for the efficiency and so on. And his response was, um, yes, but we've made an ethical decision not to do that. I wasn't allowed a second question. <laughs> but my second question would have been, couldn't one make an ethical decision not to allow the free movement of capital? <laughs> but um, so I hadn't thought about this hugely before today. And I, I must say, I'm, I have a sort of clearer big picture than I did before, and I want to check it against the economists in the room to make sure that I've got the right big picture. The big picture is that, um, that generally speaking, um, the, if you free up people to move across borders, um, generally speaking, the, economic, the overall economic effects are good. Uh, uh, to put it in the language we used, the pie gets bigger. Uh, but uh, um, as is often the case when pies change size, the, um, that doesn't mean that it's good for everybody. Even if the pie gets bigger, uh, some people may get a smaller total uh, amount. And uh, if that's right, then uh, it seems to me that the natural thought at that point would be, um, well, if, if it's good in general and there's a positive social yield, then maybe we should use some of it to advantage the people who are disadvantaged by this. So my question is, is that big picture right and is that response to it, that's my first question, is, and is that response to it a sensible response and does it have, um, I can imagine that policy responses of that redistributive sort would of course also have incentive effects which might affect migration so there might be little feedback loops here that I haven't thought about so I'd be very interested to think about that. And the second thing I wanted to say was we, um, we didn't say very much about something that economists also know a good deal about, which is what the, uh, we focused very much on the effects of migration on the countries to which the migrants were coming. Um, and on the question for that country, what should we do? And that's in the case of the philosophers, is because that's what we asked them to think about. So uh, <laughs> I'm not blaming anybody for not spending more time on this other question, but it did seem to me that um, uh, there are lots and lots of effects of migration on the countries uh, from which people depart. Uh, many of them, I mean, especially if we have a generally freer system of migration, many of those effects are going to be good, good for the countries that they leave. Um, and it does seem to me that in the policy thinking of the receiving countries, it ought to be the case that some weight is given to any positive consequences there might be in other countries. We shouldn't only be thinking about the positive or the negative consequences here. We should be thinking about positive and negative consequences everywhere else. And again, I, economists know a good deal about that. And maybe in this conversation, some of that could be brought in. So those are my two, two cents worth, as it were. OK. And um, I will have two questions. Uh, and none, neither are rhetorical, which I really would like to find out more about these. Um, so in terms of the big picture, when we discussed immigration, uh, we looked at the possible costs. And it's fair to say, I think, from the literature that I know and that has been discussed, that the economic effects, the effects on wages are at most minimal. If there are 
some groups, like 7%, according to Chad, the, they, we could deal with it. They, they, they are not very big or serious, and the, on the whole, the benefits are large in other dimensions. Same thing in terms of uh, displacing natives from jobs. So th those are not the issue. Then there are the other issues. If you live in a welfare state and you have people coming in, but we know we have studies, and I'm going to take two scenarios that I'm talking about. Now, the first scenario is under the current immigration policies. There are a number of studies from the National Science Foundation, I think, uh, uh, and, and, and others. Uh, immigrants are not a burden on the FISC. In fact, they, they make a net contribution rather than take out uh, benefits. Uh, so that's not an issue. Uh, there is a literature on the fact that, uh, oh, they, are, they commit crimes at a high rate, the MS-13 and all that, but we also know from a lot of studies that the crime rate among immigrants are lower than that of the natives. So these arguments sort of do not account for the negative sentiments. So that brings me back to the issue of immigration doing some other kind of damage that has been discussed, that it damages the, the social fabric of society, that, you know, I sort of uh, think of uh, John Rawls's view that uh, society has a culture, a way of life, values and norms, and that might be depreciated, damaged, destabilized, destroyed by immigration, and this asset, is a monetizing it in a way, so, so uh, has to be protected. Uh, fair enough, you know, so it's, it's a view. Uh, but I'd like to come back to the empirics of this. Who are we talking about and what specifically are we talking about? I'm thinking of immigrant groups. The largest one is the Mexicans. The Mexicans are largely religious, hardworking. They have family values. They are more American than Americans. <laughs> Uh, it reminds me of a, of a column by Russell Baker many years ago. He says, yes, this Im the immigrants, we should really kick them out. We should kick them out because they commit crimes, they are a burden on us. But then he says, why stop there? Let's kick out some Americans too. <laughs> so, the, and in fact, it's not just the Mexicans. In general, you find that many immigrant groups, self-selected group who comes here, uh, they say they are more Catholic than the Pope. They, they, they have uh, American values. They are patriotic, excessively maybe patriotic. They are loyal. They fight in wars. So what are we talking about, this uh, damage to the social fabric? Do we feel it? It seems like there is a perception that people feel that. So I'm, my question is, why? What's going on? It's imaginary things. But somehow people have been carried away, and I think uh, Giovanni addressed part of it. Uh, is it simple xenophobia, or is it scapegoating when the situation gets difficult or uh, adverse? There is a tendency to find, uh, put the blame on the other somehow, and we've seen examples of that in history. So maybe something like that is going on, it, because otherwise it seems to me imaginary. All the arguments, it's, it's not there. And certainly the cultural argument, I find it hard to believe. You know, the, at least, uh, I think uh, Leah talked a little bit about the foreignness index, but I think that's not enough. I think my personal experience is that immigrants are very American, more American than we are, and very nationalistic in general. So I don't know what's going on here. Um, but that's under the current levels of immigration. That's what's happening now, and you know, there is a puzzle. But when I talk to my colleagues, my economist friends, who want always to sort of argue back and forth, they legitimately say, well, look, maybe what you say is right at the current level of immigration, but what about open borders? The immigrant flows could be hundreds of millions. And if we open borders, then are you really going to tell me that you know, if, you know, 50, million, 50 million immigrants come in in one year, that they're not going to have an effect on wages, they're gonna, not going to displace people, they are not going to affect the social fabric? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, 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 I have no answer. Uh, and it puzzles me, so I don't know what to say. And then they turn around and they say, okay, so where do you draw the line? Uh, how, how much immigration? Where, how, what, what's the sense in which we can determine something? And you can say, you know, it depends, it's subjective. Some people feel it should be higher, lower. There is certainly a subjective element, and 
different people take different levels of discomfort the, uh, by the immigrants. So it's a hard question. So, um, so that's where I am, and I'm sort of confused and puzzled, don't know how to answer this. Maybe Joseph has an answer to this. But certainly, you, you go back to Rawls and you say, yeah, if there is 100 million or two, several hundred million going from uh, poorer countries into Europe and to the US, it might have an effect. It might destroy something. It might depreciate some asset that we have. Um, so th those are the questions I wish we, we, we could answer. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, and uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe somebody can sort of uh, convince me one way or another. So yes, Michael Clevens to the, to the panelists now. Uh, thank you. So, um, can I just address this question of how many immigrants, because it yes. often comes up. I, 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 uh, I find it really baffling when, when economists have this conversation. The, 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 the very same people in the same seminar room would, if you posted them the question of uh, uh, five years from now, uh, how many, uh, well, let's say 10 years from now, how many iPhones should be produced uh, for United States consumers, they'd say, well, I, I don't really know. Maybe the iPhone won't exist anymore. Maybe there'll be something much better. Or, or uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it's not possible for, for us to sit down in our offices at NYU and calculate that number. Uh, and, and yet somehow it is, it is seen by, by economists as a, as, a, as a feasible exercise to, to uh, and I'll put it in strong terms, centrally plan the labor market, because that's exactly what we're doing when we, when we say, I, I, with my sophisticated model, I will tell you what is the optimal num number of, of, of flow or stock of immigrants. Uh, all we've got to go on is, is, is marginal analysis. And, and here, I, I really think the, the proposals of, of, of Gary Becker, Richard Freeman, Giovanni Peri, and, and others for, for, a, a, for, a, uh, for price restrictions on migration that could be flexible. Uh, if, if you see at the margin uh, 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 costs exceeding benefits, uh, uh, raise the price, then the next year raise it more, raise it more, lower it if you see uh, otherwise. Rather, uh, rather than uh, than attempting to, uh, to 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 plan proper production as as as, uh, as many centrally planned economies have, have have done and failed to do, that's optimal policy, uh, and and yet uh, somehow somehow this is not even uh, among economists, much less outside of our circles, uh, seen as a as a as a feasible or even desirable uh, thing to do. And I, I really think that that so, is where you should take the conversation. Okay, if I may, sorry, may, may comment on that. When we say, when economists say free trade is good or um, immigration is good always at, at the margin or even with open, and there are actual sort of formal proofs of this, what do we mean when we say it's good? It's not good for everybody. It's good for some and not for the others. So you ask, any, should we have free trade? Well. When we say free trade is good or optimal, we mean that it is possible for the winners to give away some of their gain and compensate the others so that everybody's better off. But of course, it's never done. <laughs> and the same thing with immigration. This is all in practice. So of course, there are losers. So you have to make a value judgment as to you know, uh, how much you want to allow. And that's sort of one difficult issue. But Gary Becker. Uh, I think it was either Gary Becker or Milton Friedman. I think it was Gary Becker, since you mentioned. He had a, pol he had a proposal for auctioning uh, rights for immigration. So you could just sell that, and the market will take care of it. And whoever can pay can come and reap the benefit. And maybe we can act as a monopoly and take all the gains. So that's a possibility. But you know, certainly, the market solution that way is possible. And also, if you say you have to forecast what it is, it's going to depend on the policies, and you can't forecast the policies that are, will be in place. And, and, and any of that suite of policies is an alternative to asking an economist, well, how many immigrants should there be? Which I, I assert is an unanswerable question by economists or anybody else. It's mm -hmm. an ill-posed question. It has it's no answer. It's ill-posed because it depends. You have to tell me, it's, in principle, you can answer it if you tell me how much weight you, how much you will compensate the losers and uh, whether it will be compensated, and then we can sort of, you know, sort of at least talk about it. I don't know, it's the, empirically it's gonna be a tough question, but in principle it's answerable. But you have to know. Yeah. I just wanna add one uh, piece to what Michael said. Um, he said we wouldn't know how many immigrants would come in if we were to change policy and open borders. Um, 
And I think we do know from history how many migrants would come in. So we have had open borders with Europe during the age of mass migration. And from many of the sending countries, we had somewhere between 20 and 35% of the population of those countries move to the US. We also have had an open border within the US. If you think of the Mason-Dixon line as a border and think of black migration from the South, we had around 40% of the black population of the South move to the North and West. So that's what I would predict. Um, also based on some of Michael's work, surveys from people in developing countries, it's consistent that around half of the population of developing countries say that they would move if they could. Relatively similar to the 30 to 40% who do end up moving under situations of open borders. So that's what we would probably get. It's a um, big number, right? It's a big number, yeah. exactly. Uh, I think Joe, oh. I think Joe was, who was it? Yeah, right. He's been. Yes, go ahead. So, uh, when I get asked these questions, I resist them. Be <laughs> because it seems to me it constructs... So, so there is a, a genuine argument within the context of actual policy for having more immigration, but there's not a serious argument within, actual, within the constraints of actual policy about having open borders, because that's, uh, we know that's a political non-starter everywhere in the world. So from my own perspective, I make the open borders argument to draw attention to what I think is the injustice of the way in which the world is organized. And as I tried to say, I don't think the solution to that is to have everybody move to the United States or Canada or Europe. But the solution to that is to change conditions at home that would make it attractive to people to move all across the world. And then there should be open borders in a context in which people's lives are okay where they are. And, and, the, and the whole, this whole question of how many will move so it's a kind of art, it, it's people not taking seriously the challenge, I think, if they want to know, well, how many will you let in? And, and just to kind of elaborate on that, there are people, so one of the things when you get into this uh, immigration debate, so the Wall Street Journal is for open borders, and you may not have guessed it, but I'm not generally on the side of the Wall Street Journal on these things. <laughs> and, and similarly, you know, the people, there are lots of people who are concerned about immigration restrictions because in the kind of uh, variation of the Rawlsian view, they're concerned with the least well-off in the existing country. So traditionally, labor unions were worried about it. They have started to shift, but, but anyway, there's that concern. And those people have equally unattractive bedfellows, uh, as I have with the Wall Street Journal, with the people who want to restrict for racist reasons, right? So, so you don't have a kind of, neither position can avoid those associations. But it, it seems to me part of the question is, the, is from, a, from the philosophical point of view, from the normative point of view, is, well, who do you think counts and why? What are our obligations? Do you, here's the challenge that I want to pose to anybody who, uh, you know, kind of wants to defend concern. Do you think the way the current world is organized is morally defensible? And if so, why? What is your story about why this is an okay way to have organized the world? Uh, you know, I just never heard a good answer to that. Yeah, I, I want first to respond quickly to what uh, Leah said and, and then uh, uh, make a comment on, on one of your uh, questions. So what, what people say they'll do and what they actually do are pretty different things. So I, I wouldn't put much faith in those surveys. For example, I've seen uh, there was a survey of people in East Germany right after the wall fell, how many would move to the West. And it was vastly outstripped the number that have actually moved in the whole intervening time since then. And also uh, distance matters a lot. For example, Australia had open borders, but they had to pay people to go there. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then furthermore, the, actually not that many people from Puerto Rico uh, that live on the mainland United States, which is somewhat surprising, although it's increasing now. So I think that, th and the other thing that's important is whether the, the sending country is at the sweet spot of uh, uh, of, of richness for sending people. So intermediately rich countries have a lot of immigrants because the people have become rich enough that they can leave, but not so rich that they don't want to leave. But nevertheless, yeah, a lot of people uh, would move. I, I agree. Uh, so in response to, I, I think everyone was nodding here in response to your question that yes, you should be able to compensate the, the, the losers uh, from, the, from the policy. And, uh, but I, I just wanted to make a, a policy related point. So should we be compensating the, the losers or the, or the marginal voters? So the people that are the... <laughs> the, <laughs> the 
the people who are the marginal voters right now, I, I, I believe, have high school degrees, and we've identified high school dropouts as the people who are being hurt by immigration. And so, but but it's the people who are complaining that we may need to uh, to compensate. But that that would be uh, unpleasant, uh, sort of ethically, but uh, b but per perhaps the only political solution. And so I, I think that a successful immigration reform should have uh, sort of th three prongs. Uh, one should be here's our immigration reform which would involve at least not reducing the amount of immigration, which is what we're facing at the moment, uh, then would say, for example, let's um, make the EITC more generous. Actually, we could maybe get both groups of voters by mm -hmm. making it uh, more generous for the given people and extending it to more people. Uh, I don't think much of the EITC is an anti-poverty uh, measure, but as a way of compensating workers, that's exactly the perfect solution. And then the third thing, although I understand this has been proposed before and has never gone anywhere, but uh, w what, in fact, the National Academy's report, um, one of the, the big findings about the fiscal impact is that the federal government makes a hu huge benefit from immigrations and the state and local go governments lose. And that's especially because of the costs of educating the children of the immigrants. So a third part of the package could be to propose to give federal money to areas with a large number of immigrants. Uh, your second question, uh, what I kind of inferred from that was that it's a question a little bit about brain drain uh, and concerns about what's happening to the sending countries. Um, and I think one of the maybe less obvious things uh, to think about in that situation is the idea that two very skilled workers are collectively more skilled if they're together than if they're apart. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, discussion about whether you call them talent clusters or economies of agglomeration or what have you, that if you have hot spots like Silicon Valley as an example, um, that they can be more productive uh, and then that can lead to remittances in an obvious sense, but also technology transfer back to the home country uh, and, and so might actually be a net gain for the sending country in, in ways that, uh, as I said, a lot of people don't necessarily think of from, from the outset. If I could just jump onto that, when I lived in Canada and I would go to conferences where there are people from Citizenship and Immigration Canada speaking and they would be all excited, we've, we've just accepted the best people from all over the world and I would see where all over the world was and I would feel a little guilty thinking how much those people could be contributing in their own country. But just as we're talking about the right to enter a country, there should also be the right, and that actually is inscribed as a fundamental right, the right to leave your country. Uh, so I, I don't think they should be prevented from emigrating, but perhaps countries that take skilled immigrants should have to actually compensate the, the country that they're coming from, at least if they got public education. Hi, thank you. Um, I was curious, um, in thinking about this, I thought I wanted to get back to the question of both the imaginary and the political. Um, because one thing I was sort of struck by is when we were in both uh, Professor Appiah and Professor Ben Abi both, both brought up the idea of the imaginary, right? And that there's, um, and you know, um, Professor Ben Habib been listening to all the reasons why anti-immigrant arguments or, or these problematic arguments about immigrants are, are fundamentally factually wrong, right? They're factually wrong, but they're politically effective. Right? And so I think, so one of the questions I'm thinking about is, right, is partly this has to do with the fact that there's a vision of scarcity and loss that comes with people, even people who think there's a positive benefit to a more just immigration policy. When they imagine that more fair or just immigration policy, one of the fears they have, right, is they're going to inhabit a world, if you're from a rich, developed country, you're going to inhabit a world of scarcity and loss, right? And I always get that image of like the boat that's going to sink because so many people are trying to get on it. Right. So I, I guess one of the question I have or, or I think we have to think about is our task as political theorists or those of us who think about the political is to ask this question of what would a more porous migration policy look like and how do we make, in other words, if nativists look at the world, it has to look more than fair. It has to look appealing. So I think one of our tasks now is not simply to make arguments about fairness, but to make arguments about a world of more porousness, a world of movement and mobility, that has to look like a world that members look at and say, I would like to inhabit that world rather than this world, right? I, would, I need that world to look more appealing, more, you know, so there's like an aesthetics of justice here, I think that's just interesting that we have to also be thinking about because one of the political arguments we have to do, we have to win a political argument, is, is that fairness is a world that feels attractive to inhabit and appealing to inhabit as opposed to simply fair.
or just. It has to feel like a world they want to live in that we want to build together. And so that's sort of the, I just think that's a really interesting problematic question for political theorists and those of us who think about this as we have to kind of imagine what that world would look like. And, yeah. Danny? Yeah, so actually I have so one uh, thought related to just this, this point and then I have a question for some of the philosophers. Um, so I, I think one of the issues that we haven't really talked about and which I think is in the background is this question, you know, what is it that people are so worried about, they dislike so much about uh, immigration when it doesn't look like it's really explained by the economics of it or not at least by rational assessment of the economics of it? Is it just pure xenophobia? And I suppose there's a question to what extent there is, you know, I'm, I'm trying to put, if you will, the most plausible face on this, speaking myself as a, if you'll, completely rootless cosmopolitan. I'm trying to, <laughs> nonetheless, so see what somebody might see in this. And I think one, um, at least not absolutely implausible thought just is, some people just really like stability and certainty in their social environment, right? The sense that they know whom they're meeting, they know what the people mean in terms of their social interactions, their body language, et cetera, with whom they're surrounded, they understand the language, and they, uh, plausibly overreact, but might at least react to, I mean, as you said, the aesthetics of it, right? The, at least the appearance of things changing so much they no longer feel like they can just go to the supermarket and know what the people around them are doing and thinking and how they're behaving. They just, they just feel alienated in a certain way. And so one question is, is that really part of the explanation? In fact, if we try and figure out what people's reaction, is that really what's driving some of their political judgments? And then part of the thought is, and how seriously should we take this? I mean, are they just being irrational, basically? Um, or are we basically, in, in, res, in, in if you're refusing to take this seriously, adopting a certain cosmopolitan, pro-change, uh, sort of urban attitude towards things that, that's just a sort of out of tune aesthetically with the things they're committed to? Um, the, the second, if you're the real question, I suppose, I have is for the philosophers who are all committed in one way or another to the importance of self-determination, of whom there are several. Uh, and it's really about the limits of this, right? So as some of you emphasized, one um, important element of self-determination seems to be the capacity to choose with whom to associate, right? So who's going to be, to make choice about the membership, so to somehow have something to say about the membership of your political community, that's in part what the collective self-determination consists in. But now, there's one, if you're the primary way in which membership in our political community is determined, which is by birth to you know, native or people who already live here. Now, one obvious way in which you might think self-determination then kicks in is that right one say, well, look, if you're so concerned about self-determination, should we be imposing limits? Or should we be able to impose limits on the procreative choices of our fellow citizens. Because we don't want to associate with these newly born people whom they're putting in the world and we didn't have a choice on the matter. And the other way of putting this is, why should we somehow give, and I think many of us would recoil from this thought. We think this is absolutely unacceptable. Then why do we think it's unacceptable to appeal to the important self-determination when it comes to imposing these kinds of limits on people's choices about putting new people into our community by giving birth, and we somehow think it's acceptable to impose these kinds of limits on their choices by, to have new people join the community by, say, inviting foreigners, their best friend if you're Canadian, etc., to become part of this community and live alongside them, etc. Now, obviously there might be extreme cases where, I don't know, sort of emergencies in, requires to impose limits on procreation, so, but I take it in the general run of things. We don't think it'd be okay for a community to say, oh look, you know, there's a one child, two child, zero child policy, because we don't like to have these new people join our community, and yet this seems to be what people are willing to say about immigration. So I'm just wondering where people, what people's thoughts on this are. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to make one comment on this, because um, self-determination is fine, but there's a darker side to it. Uh, it seems like uh, it could be not static xenophobia, but in times of stress, after all, we've seen automation may be responsible for uh, difficulties that some parts of the country are having. It might be uh, uh, globalization, it might be outsourcing, it might be fiscal policies. And then there are political entrepreneurs who may uh, hijack this sentiment. And we've seen it over and over again in history, and uh, I just want to cite one. This is from an interview with Goering just before he 
he committed suicide in, in Nuremberg. And he, a journalist asked him, how come you were able to get away and do all the things you did, these horrible things? He said, oh, it's very easy. You just have to tell people that there are some outside forces who are coming in and are going to uh, destroy uh, your well-being, your lifestyle, and people will follow you anywhere. Uh, and it's not, uh, so, you know, here you have a sort of a society which votes, uh, and uh, you, you, I think philosophers knew this, Plato must have known this, uh, and demagogues uh, can, 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 uh, can take charge. So that's what I worry about. Um, here, uh, I want to take the opportunity that uh, today we're talking about uh, ethics of immigration and not just economics to, to ask about um, what do we think about the issue of um, the dreamer population and uh, what, from the perspective of what may be the rights that we consider fundamental or that they uh, have to do with their intimate sphere uh, when we think about do they from an ethical standpoint, should they get the right to stay? Should they get the right that their parents not be deported? I think I know the answer, but I would like to know what the, the pros think about it. <laughs> well, if I may say, I mean, this is one of the places where my own mildly skeptical view about the idea of self-determination arises. Um, uh, because this is a case where it's uh, where there is disagreement about political membership, mm -hmm. um, and it is not, and we can't settle it by first deciding who the members are and then asking them, uh, because the question of who the members are is exactly what's at stake. So, and I, and so, um, I think that people who've been raised in a place, however they got there and have grown up there, have as good a right as anybody, uh, whatever their legal citizenship, to, 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 to stay around. That seems to me kind of minimally decent view, given the importance of the community that a person grows up in in shaping who they are. They should be free to leave as well, but, uh, but they should certainly be free to stay. But that takes, you, that, that takes a, a view about how you, as it were, acquire membership there's a substantive view. You could have the, you, you could just have a use solely view. You could just say the way you acquire membership is by being born within some boundary. That would mean that uh, the children of American soldiers abroad and American diplomats would have to petition uh, to re-enter the United States and so on. Um, as it happens, historically, our American citizenship law grows out of European British citizenship laws, which already had a way of dealing with the children of diplomats and people serving the country abroad, and which therefore, in our tradition, we would, as it were, automatically have treated them as members, even if they weren't born on the soil, even though the presumption was generally that you got to be a member by being born in the place. So I think um, the notion of self-determination doesn't really, it doesn't, it, we need a notion of membership in order to settle the self-determination question. So you can't use self-determination when issues of membership are exactly what's at stake. This is the point that the Scottish Prime Minister made about Brexit. Um, who, who's the people that are supposed to have self-determination here? If you asked the Scots, uh, Brexit wouldn't have happened if you asked, uh, and so on. So, uh, what? The British abroad who couldn't vote. Uh, yes, and there were British abroad who couldn't vote, and, uh, and so on. So, and, um, you know, uh, What's going to happen is that, in the case of Brexit, is that, um, is that the, the current nations are going to have to be the units of movement. But an alternative, equally self-determinist strategy, would be to allow London and the southeastern counties to make, remain in Europe and to have a hard border between them and the parts of Britain that voted another way. Uh, I mean, that, that, is, that would be equally consistent with self-determination. Nobody's going to do it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it seems to me that self-determination actually doesn't answer as many questions as it might precisely because it presupposes that these questions of membership are kind of easily settled, and I don't think they are. <laughs>
um, I'd like to ask a question about how the narrative against immigration is shaped. So it seems to me um, pretty obvious that if you're to look at the facts that immigration historically has benefited countries both in the United States and in Europe, but there's a very powerful appeal to the anti-immigrant nationalist populist narrative. So how is it shaped? Who shapes it? Who benefits by it? Um, Steve Bannon recently said that the roots of the current wave of populism are in the 2008 financial crisis. So to what extent uh, do these uh, various financial crises in uh, the history of nations contribute to uh, anti-immigrant sentiment? How is it linked? I wanted to ask a question that was, or bring up something that was somewhat related. Um, so we heard about shaping a narrative that makes a just world seem appealing, and also about some the, of the appeal of stability to some people. And as I was thinking about those comments, I thought about the oscillations in immigration over American history. So the graph that I put up showing the share foreign born, 15% in 1920, down to 5% in 1970, back up to 15%. Why when people look to the past, are they thinking of 1970 and not of 1920? When they think of the make America great again, why is it that the stability that they're seeking is in the world of the 60s and 70s which was a world of very limited migration, rather than the America of the 1910s and 20s, um, where 50 plus percent of New York was foreign born, and we're back up to around 40% today. How can we make that the story that people have in mind, or the, the view, the vision that they have in mind? Uh, Michael Clinton. Uh, um. I, I want to bring us back briefly to, to brain drain, just because it's something that I've worked on and I, I think it's very important. Uh, I have a paper, that, that the title of which is A Case Against Taxes and Quota on High Skill Migration. And uh, you know, the, the idea that there is a, a, a harm exerted on, on, on people in, in countries of origin when high skilled people leave uh, has been the subject of proposals by economists. Uh, Jagdish Badwa has, has proposed coercive taxes on them. Uh, Paul Collier has proposed coercive uh, quotas on the ability of high skilled people to leave. Um, I, I, I point out in that paper that this, uh, if we're talking about, uh, about n a natural talent, you know, IQ, that sort of thing, uh, th then it amounts to the assertion, and this, uh, this comes from economist Ronald Coase, that, that, that imposing a, a, a tax or, or a quota of that kind that economists would call a Peguvian tax or a Peguvian quota uh, uh, necessarily assumes a distribution of property rights. That is, that the fact that you are born uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Zambia and are smart uh, conveys to Zambians a, a, a limited property right in your brain. And I, I think that that is uh, ethically debatable at, at, at best. If, if we're talking just about the, the cost of education, uh, which, uh, which is a, a, a different form of this conversation uh, uh, only, then it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, it is equally problematic in that uh, I, I think most people in this room probably don't live where uh, taxpayers paid for their primary education. Uh, and, and we would never think of doing that because no, nobody at the time told us that the, uh, our neighbor's investment in our primary education was a, was a cash investment that they expected a, a return on investment from. But the point of it was so that we could realize our ambitions as human beings. And, and that's, that's all that they cared about. Uh, and, and, and certainly that's a, that's a portion of higher education as well. Uh, the, 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 the standard case that people cite is African doctors in the United States. The, the average African trained doctor in the United States actually practiced in Africa for seven years on average, according to a survey that I did before migrating. So did, 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 did African governments paying for their training as doctors confer a, a lifetime right in, to the services of that person? If it's a more limited right, such as three, four, five years, which might seem reasonable, the average person has already done that. So I, it's hard to see even the empirical justification for taxes or quotas for that reason. 
I, I, I've talked too much, but I, I want to raise that I, I think it's a, it's a much more complicated issue, uh, both in economic theory uh, and empirically, than, than some economists have portrayed it, uh, as, as much as, uh, as Jagdish Bhagwati and Paul Collier and others are very careful economists. Yeah. Actually, I was thinking of the, I was mostly thinking about the remittances issue. I hadn't been, I wasn't actually thinking very much about the, the brain drain issue. Because my sense is that um, the, the net yield of, uh, of highly trained uh, expatriates to a country like Ghana, where I grew up, is pretty high, even as expatriates. Um, I mean, those doctors didn't just serve seven years. Many of them go back for a month every summer and do free clinics and so on. And they're bringing skills that they've acquired because they're professors or uh, doctors at the Mayo Clinic, uh, which Ghana couldn't actually uh, pr produce for itself very easily. So, um, so, I, so that, that, that isn't one of the cases that worries me. But, but yeah, I think it is important to be realistic about what actually is happening to those high-skilled migrants. And many countries do require some years of service in return for a free tertiary education, that doesn't seem unreasonable. They require it of people whether they leave or not. Um, okay. Here and then Paul. Yes. So what I've heard all day today is there's no economic rationale against immigration in the short term. Um, we all know this country would not be the economic engine it is without immigration in the long term. The voters who are most likely to be nativists are people who live where they are least likely to encounter immigrants. Um, which sends me to what we're thinking about is fear. Um, which sends me to a question which is, is it not possible that it isn't about immigration at all? That it's really about a distrust and dislike of us, meaning cosmopolitan New Yorkers, cosmopolitan Chicagoans, cosmopolitan Jackson Mississippians. Um, no, and that this is, what, what is happening to immigrants is collateral damage in our cold civil war. <laughs> I mean, I think that's part of the answer to, to I think to Daniel's question. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think so. Sort of skepticism of elites combined with the elite consensus in a room like this that on the whole migration is a good thing is enough reason for certain people to be against it. But who commandeers are the Steve Bannons? How come yeah. the sentiments? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was... Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh. Sahar, it's Paul first, sorry. I, I just want to follow up on the very good point I think that uh, Anthony made about the difficulty of using self-determination as a way of settling issues about membership and I was hoping that Kit Wellman, for whom this played a very large role, would, would, would say something in response to that. Uh, sure. So, uh, absolutely right. Uh, you can't uh, determine who the people are until you know who the people are, and there's this riddle, right? And so different accounts of self-determination, oh, everyone owes you a story if they're going to tell um, the self-determination story, and they're going to be various accounts, right? It could be cultural, uh, if you're interested in cultural self-determination, it could be where you're born, um, it could be uh, my own view, which is a democratic uh, self-determination is going to be a mixture of um, politically viable groups and then reiterative uh, plebiscites. Um, and so the idea is that not every individual, I won't go into the details because I probably couldn't do it if you gave me enough time anyway, but um, the idea is not every, it, it's inalimitably collective because we, uh, the political project is necessarily collective, right? We have to coordinate. And so then the question is, so we take states as a given, but that doesn't mean that we take the current states as a given. And so we're, we can reconfigure the states and that's gonna be an iteration of, uh, or, or multiple iterations of plebiscites as long as they're consistent with these states performing the requisite political functions which are satisfactorily protecting the human rights of their constituents. So that's, the details of my account are probably wrong, but you're exactly right. Anyone who peddles self-determination 
owes you an account, and since mine is a political self-determination account, it's gonna be based on political abilities. Um, I'll say a couple things as long as I've got the mic. Um, so the idea that we never distribute, uh, redistribute the pie once the pie gets bigger is not true, right? So I don't know if it was eight or 10 years ago, we liberalized the textile industry. So we used to have enormous tariffs uh, on Chinese and Indian textiles um, and uh, to protect domestic textile, textile workers. And of course this is horribly inefficient, the economists tell us so, and so we drop this tariff and we win big. Who's we? Most of us. There are some losers, like the people in uh, Western North Carolina who are in the textile industry. So one of the things we did is we said, if you lose your job as a consequence of this, we're going to give you extended unemployment. We're going to give you money for re-education. You can go back to college. We'll pay for this, right? We're even going to pay for your mileage to go to and from college, right? All this stuff was taken care of. Right? So if we can do this when we move to something that's economically more efficient uh, in terms of tariffs, we can do this with respect to migration. Uh, now, whether or not we will... No, no, I, uh, I, I didn't mean to say there is no redistribution in yeah. the U.S. Okay, I'm sorry. There is minimal, but very often when you open up to trade, there isn't a corresponding right. law, uh, hopefully. And the rich get so richer. I just wanted to emphasize yeah. that the, it is in, in principle possible to redistribute the gains from trade so nobody loses to what extent it happens, and the same with immigration. So, you know, you have to think if enough is being done. But I have a, a, a question about uh, the plebiscite, though. Uh, <laughs> where, uh, I thought we saw this morning what happened in Indiana had a legislation, and it was democratically elected, and they had some making laws. My father-in-law told me that uh, when he was trying to move to Bronxville, a long time ago, uh, Jews weren't allowed, and uh, was blacks certainly, and they had decided to, to, to undertake this democratically. So what do you do? What, what, which boundary is the right polity? So there's two different questions. One is uh, what are the territorial boundaries, and the other is what are the moral boundaries, right? And so if you're someone like me who thinks that uh, the, question, the permissible questions should be answered democratically. That doesn't mean all questions should be answered democratically. It doesn't mean you get to say, oh, we get to exclude blacks if we want, or if the majority votes for it, we get to enslave blacks, all right? So the questions that um, the demos gets to decide are limited by the individual rights of uh, people. Um, and uh, so we don't let a demos decide, for instance, that someone may not move a certain place because uh, she's Jewish. Uh, and then it's the territorial boundary. So if one of the questions that the demos does get to decide is what the configurations of these politically viable states are gonna be. And that uh, is gonna take multiple iterations. Um, there are other things, as long as I got the mic, I'll, I will answer Daniel's question. I think the idea about breeding, right, is, is very important, right? So you come to me and say, look, Kit, uh, self-determination, what if they say we don't want any bigger, does this mean that you're going to be willing to say to folks, you may not breed, right? Uh, because we don't want these new members, whether they're coming from outside or they're coming from your womb. And uh, I'm going to say, I'm not an absolutist here. I take it that the, the, the right to procreate is an incredibly important right. So we shouldn't be apologetic if we say, this is one of the last things that we're going to circumscribe, right? But if things, as you mentioned, if things are extreme enough, I have no problem with saying there are limits, right? Uh, that uh, people may not um, have more than two children or something like that. And then the interesting move, which was implicit in your comment, is what if you say, okay, well, I agree not to breed at all. Does that mean I can bring in two of my foreign <laughs> friends? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the question about membership, um, I'm glad Kit made the comments that he did. So. My own view of membership, I borrow it heavily from Anna Stills's view, um, and uh, where, whereby location and just presence establishes membership, because it, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to minimize the importance that location has on our life plans. And so I think anybody who's there, whether by birth, by um, irregular means, in whatever way, um, I would count them happily as members. Um, but I just wanted to also just um, address the question that uh, Daniel 
and um, the gentleman in front of me um, was, um, was, were commenting on the issues they were commenting on about sort of a distrust for the unfamiliar and maybe, it's, maybe it boils down to a distrust for elite New York intellectuals. Um, I, I know that there's, there's also a lot of animosity um, among immigrant communities, um, there, or at least some distrust of uh, new arrivals from the same immigrant community that they happen to um, inhabit. And that can, I don't think that can be as easily dismissed as just uh, an, an unfamiliar or a worry about the unfamiliar. Um, and so my, my uh, parents had moved from Pakistan when we were living in the UK. And I remember when we finally moved to the US, they, they kept saying, oh, we miss London, we miss London. It was so great. And I said, well, why did you move? Uh, well, because too many Pakistanis were coming. And this was, a, this was sort of a constant refrain. And I think and it, for them, it really came down to they weren't, they weren't adapting to the cultural practices. Now, what's, this gets us back to what the cultural practices are. Um, and I think, for me at least, it would have to be something like the public political culture. Um, where I think language and um, uh, a shared sense of the political ideals um, are very important. Just uh, on this issue of membership, um, like Kit and Sahar, I uh, am really sympathetic to a political conception of the collective. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right to pose the challenge that any account of collective self-determination needs to have some independent account of who the collective is. and. Uh, on my account, I, I think in, in virtue of being present in the territory, you become part of the social fabric, so it would include dreamers and other undocumented, un, unauthorized. They've become part of our community. Um, it, and I think that that, can, that view, uh, so there's a, a circularity and arbitrariness to, well, everybody who's here is a member. Um, and, uh, but, and I want to say that's the collective that gets to determine future members. Um, I, I wanted to, while I have the mic to following Kit, I just wanted to say about um, Professor Appiah's point about the importance of bringing the perspective of sending countries into these debates to kind of zoom out and think more globally. And here I'm thinking about Britain's uh, policy where the NHS does not actively recruit doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals from developing countries. And I, so I, I am, um, I do believe in the freedom of exit, uh, but, I, but I think that <laughs> There are responsibilities on the part of wealthy countries um, to not exacerbate brain drain, right? It, it, it doesn't mean that <coughs> then the proper policy is to constrain any movement, but actually that there are um, different uh, activities that they can refrain from, which is actively recruiting. Because in the short term, I think that the sending country does take a hit, that there is a loss, but maybe in the long term, uh, <coughs> there will ultimately be benefits. I, I think I'm up next. Uh, so I have a question for the philosophers, but first actually I wanted to respond to Professor Akhtar. It's actually very logical that immigrants would be opposed to f further immigrants because uh, the, the people most similar to today's immigrants are yesterday's immigrants, and so they're competing most closely in the labor market. And although actually there's not as much work on this as one might think, I think pretty much all economists think that the people most <coughs> hurt by immigration are the earlier immigrants. And, and so uh, th that actually is logical, although there may be additional non-economic things on economic terms. But I was wondering, with the, for the philosophers, uh, there are actually not many economists who've worked on, on refugees, but one of the ones who's been working on it for quite a long time, Tim Hatton, his response to the, the wave of Syrians arriving in 2015 was, was the following, and I, I think using the, the utilitarian uh, approach that we always use in economics, but I was wondering what your r reaction is. His view was that, that Syrian refugees, let's just assume they're all refugees and, and not worry about asylum seekers who are not genuine refugees, that they're actually uh, better off than uh, refugees who've been in the UN camps in Africa for a long time. And so what Europe should do is seal off its borders and not take many Syrians, but take lots of people from African camps. And so assuming this actually happened, which I don't think it would, I think the sealing off part would happen and the African arrivals would never happen, but let's just assume that they did happen. Is this sort of utilitarian argument the right way to go? Or even if we accept that the Africans are worse off, is there a greater duty to people who've actually arrived on your doorstep? <laughs> So 
uh, when I write about refugees, I say, that, you know, one of the basic principles, non refoulement won't, you can't send people back. So I don't, I don't, I think it would be a mistake to abandon that principle. But it doesn't follow that that's the extent of the obligation. And here I want to return to this idea about the aesthetics of justice. So, so within some parameters, there are ways of, of making this be attractive. You know, at the same time that Donald Trump was campaigning in the United States, uh, Trudeau was campaigning in Canada, and he was saying, we're Canadians, we're going to take... So there was an... And you've got the same values in the United States. You know, a different... A skilled politician could have appealed to a different set of American values and American traditions. And let's not forget, it was a 50... You know, he got less than a minority. So. What you needed was somebody to kind of mobilize that dimension of American political culture that talks about who we are as a community and this history that we have and how great that makes us. And now that's taking in 30,000 in Canada or 50,000. Uh, so, and in Germany, in Germany, by contrast, they took in a million and now there's the backlash, right? So. So at the, at the level of practical politics, it does seem to me you always have to make a judgment about the consequences of the policies. And if it turns out that Alternative for Germany wins, although I applauded Merkel at the time, uh, then that would have been a mistake because that would have negative consequences. At another level, at a principled level, you can say even a million in Germany and 80,000 in Canada is not enough compared with what we owe. So uh, as academics, we can step back from what you have to do as politicians and it seems to me reflect critically about what we think are the fundamentals and then also about what's reasonable to do within constraints and you, you you're not you're not bound you know if you're a political actor you just have to decide among the options that are available to you but as, as academics we're not constrained in the same way and we shouldn't let ourselves i mean a particular academic can of course for work but as a whole we shouldn't feel that we are constrained not to think at these multiple levels and to go back and forth can I quickly respond to that? So at the time I was talking to people in Germany, some of whom gave me your argument that if, if we let in these people, we're going to get the far right in government. And my view was that if you don't let them in, then you've already become the far right in government. And, and, and so but it's not true, right? So it depends. It, so I said a million would be too many. So, so Merkel uh, was taking a very different position from the people in France and Britain. So it's not all or nothing, right? The point would be, when do you decide kind of what the, what the current political environment will bear? And if you overestimate, you know, in a context in which you can get some of what you want, but not all of it, right? So that's what I'm talking about. Where, where is the kind of, where is the, and, and it may be the case, and so this comes back to the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. In the chapter on, on refugees, I say that, you know, yes, you should, whenever you can make morality and interest coincide, you should do so. You make an argument about why it's moral to uh, take in immigrants and why it's good for us. And why, so that's always better if you can make morality and interest coincide. But there may be contexts in which you can't, in which morality and interest, no matter how constructed, really do conflict. And there it is. You have to... Uh, just real, real quick, I was just thinking one thing about this question of aesthetics and thinking about um, morality and this, this sort of um, issue that I think one, one space in which we can see visions of possibility are from or, immigrants organizing themselves, particularly unauthorized immigrants organizing themselves. And I do think those are often missing voices in this question. And there's some really wonderful scholarship by like Alfonso Gonzalez and Paula Postolitas. There's a lot of people um, in Latino studies um, and in at the intersection of political theory and Latino studies who are really trying to engage what are undocumented immigrants, what are immigrants organizing, what kind of visions of the world are they painting? They're not just being acted upon, they're acting and they're organizing and they're making political claims that are often very unsettling for people. But I do feel like those voices are, are, are articulating norms of membership or practices of membership that people can take issue with, but, but they are part of the conversation and too often they're not part of our conversations. And they ought to be because the scholarship that's engaging undocumented organizing and activism I think is really critical right now and it's a really rich body of work that's emerging. Just briefly on Merkel, uh, can, I, can I push back in a different dimension than Jenny did? Uh, uh, 1956, uh, 200,000 Hungarians show up in Austria. Uh, they were resettled within uh, a, a, couple, uh, uh, a few months uh, to 37 different countries. Uh, if, if 36 of those countries had said, uh, in, including Austria itself, so if 36 of those countries had said, look, you're all just going to have to go to Austria, it would have increased Austria's population by 
uh, much more in relative terms than what happened in Germany. And, uh, and in that situation, I'd say, well, the, 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 the ethical choice, the, the, the unethical choice was, was made by the 36 countries, not by oh, Austria. I yeah. So, so I, when people, if, if indeed Merkel's decision leads to the, the, the rise of the far right, uh, should we be blaming Merkel or should we be, be no, well, blaming the countless other countries that, that, that produced that result? No, but completely. But the point is, when you're making a political decision, you can't say, what should I do if everybody else were acting justly? You have to decide, what should I do given what I think everybody else is going to do? And you can have a critique of what they're doing, and you should have a critique of what they're doing. That's what I'm saying. I think the other countries will work. But you can say, uh, in that context, you still have to make a judgment about whether or not taking in the million will ultimately make it harder to take in refugees in the future to, to continue on that sort of welcoming path. Because, the, because these other people are acting in the way that they're acting. You don't like the way they're acting, you want to, I'm not criticizing, so right, if, if I were writing an op-ed piece, I would praise Merkel and Trudeau, in the, I would praise Merkel and Trudeau and I would criticize Macron and, and uh, whoever it was who was in power in the UK at the time, uh, what was this, uh, Cameron I think, and, uh, so, yes, absolutely, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's not a mistake if, if in fact, her, if, she, if she tried to do too much. Certainly we would start with Orban if we were talking about Fair. ethics, and yeah, then Absolutely, to right, right, absolutely, absolutely. Oh. Okay, you have to. Uh, so, I, I just want to add a thought that puts together some of this, uh, of a policy characteristics which I think will help quite a bit uh, reach a lot of the goals of, uh, uh, of economists of immigration and uh, r reduce the worries of people who like an homogeneous society. I think in this area, uh, gradualism pay and immigration is a force that is changing the world and the change you can see it in decades not in years so let me give a couple of examples the reform of 1965 in the US that uh, reintroduced uh, uh, family reunification in fact as the major channel reshaped completely immigration in the United States but over 40 years not in a night Admitting Syrian refugees uh, was done extremely badly in Europe because the war in Syria started producing refugees in 2011, in 2012, and then 13, and then 14, and then 15. A little bit more of planning and gradualism, admitting 200,000, 300,000 per year, would have not even raised the level to something which would have been an international controversy. The Trump administration and the Obama administration sometimes before that are taking small, have taken small steps that people don't even notice, um, making more complicated to get a student visa, make it harder to get an H-1B visa, deporting a little bit more people consistently over time. Sorry, the Obama administration, let me say things, I'm looking at deportation. Uh, the Obama administration had a terrible record in deportation in his first uh, term from 2008 to 12, which was strongly reversed in the second part of the administration in which deportation went down. These small changes in the long run really shape our economies, but are the big immediate decisions that are on the first pages and scare people or don't scare people. So what is completely missing in migration is planning. So migration policy should be something that we sit down and make some multi-year plan, I think, and uh, I think uh, um, kind of reasonable approach um, and, and you know the elites are associated with this cosmopolitan view and so maybe they're hated by the rest but really the reasonable approach would be let's work on the margin a little bit and let's uh, start getting something in the long run you will see the effect maybe this will not have such uh, a big impact uh, in opposing those type of policies. I guess what worries me is that there seems to have been some planning and there are three and a half, three to three and a half million refugees in Turkey. They've been resettled there, uh, not in good circumstances, especially the children. Uh, Europe has refused, not only refused, but came to a very nice arrangement. Pay them, pay them to keep them in camps. Uh, and this is not lack of planning, this is a lot of planning. So I think the, and these are not 
immigrants or illegal immigrants. This is what we think people should be uh, allowed to have a, uh, a good life, the refugees. So I'm not uh, optimistic that uh, planning is going to improve things. I think he was in favor of good planning rather good planning. than bad planning. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we are, we are done. Thank you very much, and uh, it's been delightful, and thank you to all the panelists. Thank you all, thank you all very much. <laughs>